Welcome back to Module 6. In this section, we're going to be exploring different ways that astronomers measure distances in astronomy. And then we're going to talk about what the large-scale structure looks like beyond our own galaxy. So, as a couple of reminders for us, we have already learned about two different methods for determining distance. At the end of Module 4, we introduced the idea of parallax, that based on the different perspectives from parts of our orbit, we see nearby stars seem to shift against background stars. Back when we covered that, we identified that uh, we can see the same kind of thing just using our, uh, our eyes and hand. If we hold our thumb up and cover one eye or close one eye and we see it in one spot compared to the background and we shift which eye is open, it seems like our thumb moves even though it doesn't. And that helped us understand a little bit about parallax, that the closer the star is, the more of a shift this will be, and the farther away a star is, the smaller the shift, until at some point we don't notice a measurable shift. Parallax only works for nearby stars. And it turns out that this is the only method for direct measurement in astronomy. And uh, if we think about everyday lives, different distance measurements that we might use, if we have a ruler and we can physically um, measure a piece of paper, that's a direct measurement. If instead we notice a um, car off in the distance and we kind of just guess at how far away it seems, uh, that isn't a direct measurement if we don't know the size of the car, for example. Now, when we uh, introduced Cepheid variable stars in Module 6, the start of this module, we talked about the fact that in order to get a period luminosity relation, those Cepheid variable stars had to be calibrated where a handful, about a dozen, needed to have parallax measurements also so that we knew how truly far away they were because otherwise all we would have is a period apparent brightness relation and that doesn't do much for us. So we had to have a solid understanding of parallax in order to get uh, the next step up to Cepheid variables. And that starts to introduce this idea of the distance ladder where this, this analogy of a ladder is because you have to have your foot solidly on one rung before you're able to get to the next one. Parallax can be used for nearby stars within our own Milky Way galaxy. And for Cepheid variables, we learned that Harlow Shapley used them to get distances to different globular clusters within the Milky Way, even on the opposite side of the Milky Way galaxy. And Edwin Hubble used Cepheid variable stars in order to get the distance to Andromeda galaxy, so a nearby galaxy. So we're starting to get this sense that uh, parallax can be used inside our galaxy, Cepheid variables can be used in our neighborhood, around the galaxy, but what, what else can we use? So to start to talk about this, we've got one big um, idea for us that starts back in 1913. Vesto Slipher, before we knew what galaxies were, that uh, we were still calling these things spiral nebulae, he was studying these different spiral nebulae at Lowell Observatory in Arizona. And he identified that uh, Andromeda, the Andromeda Nebula, was moving towards us. Using the Doppler shift, it was blue shifted, it was moving towards us. Several years later, he continued to do this work with uh, spiral nebulae that looked smaller, that had a smaller angular size. And he identified that all of those that he was studying seemed to be moving away from us, that they had red shifts, they were moving away from us. And he identified that the higher and higher the red shifts that he detected, the smaller and smaller the angular size of these uh, spiral nebulae. And if we think about it, we can either um, assume that there's something strange going on with size and speed, or like physical size and speed, or we can realize that if something looks smaller to us, like a car that is farther and farther down the road, if it looks smaller to us, that tells us that it's farther away. So this was the first kind of big hints that we had that more distant objects seem to be moving away from us. And that's gonna have big implications later in this module as well. So George Lemaitre in, um, in Europe started theorizing, Edwin Hubble uh, in the US started making follow-up observations. 
So kind of attacking this problem in two different ways. And uh, Hubble's observations uh, were really what um, astronomy has for a long time kind of recorded as the key thing to get to this key understanding. Uh, but it's very recently that the International Astronomical Union suggested that both of these scholars should get their names recognized for their work. Because between the uh, theory and the observations, both kind of avenues of research were suggesting that the farther and farther an object, uh, a galaxy was, the faster and faster away it was moving. And the theory behind that was that the entire universe is expanding in size. All the distances between different things are expanding, a topic that we'll get a lot more detail about later in this module. So the Hubble-Lemaitre law uh, is written as the velocity, and it's the radial velocity, so the towards away direction, is equal to this uh, constant called the Hubble constant, h naught, or h subscript zero, times the distance to that galaxy. So h naught, if we know the number, that's incredibly important for us, we can get the velocity from direct observations of Doppler shift, and that allows us to determine the distance. So why are all of these galaxies redshifted? That's because they're all moving away from us. Well, why are they moving away from us? As I hinted in the previous slide, the universe is expanding. And the question of why the universe is expanding is a big, big question and one that we're gonna save for a separate video, but it'll be coming up soon. Now it's worth recognizing that for this to really work, to be a solid um, rung on our ladder, we have to know the Hubble constant. And it is worth recognizing that recent survey data of different, um, different methods have uh, given us numbers that are between 66 and 76 in the units that we're not gonna worry about, but they don't actually all agree with each other. So this is an open question in astronomy it's starting to kind of identify for us that the Hubble constant is um, maybe not so constant. Uh, and it's something that we'll get back to um, again in a later video. It is worth recognizing that for us to use this method, we have to have an accurate measurement of that Hubble constant. We have to know whether it's 68 or 72. So to properly calibrate it, we need a ladder rung in between Cepheid variables and these, um, these data measurements. And so to calibrate it, we need to rely on type 1a supernova. Now I want us to take a moment, flip through our notes if we need to, to make sure that we feel confident knowing what type of supernova this is. A type 1a supernova is when a white dwarf that is right at the maximum mass, 1.4 solar masses, is given material by a binary companion so that it goes past that mass limit and it's catastrophic explosion for that poor white dwarf. The reason why it has to be this type of supernova and not a type 2 supernova, not a core collapse at the end of a massive star, is because every type 1a supernova that we see is the same true actual brightness because this, it is the same type of material and the exact same amount of material that is going through this catastrophic explosion. It's like knowing that you have a specific amount of TNT uh, that you're blowing up. It's also like getting a light bulb at the store that you know is 100 watts. So no matter where you see it uh, distance-wise, you know it's supposed to be that certain brightness. So we call these, uh, these types of objects in astronomy, because type 1a supernova are one of a couple different um, objects, standard candles or standard light bulbs, because they all have the same known true brightness the same luminosity, the same absolute magnitude. So when we put all this together, parallax is that bottom rung. It is absolutely necessary for us to be able to make accurate measurements of any other distance method because we put our foot on the parallax uh, rung to get up to the Cepheid variables. Those Cepheid variable stars are bright enough that we can see them in nearby galaxies and not just our own galaxy.
And so once we get the distance to a nearby galaxy that contains Cepheid variables and type 1a supernova, then we can calibrate our um, type 1a supernova. So it's imagine that we have a bunch of light bulbs that are all the same, but we don't know if they were 60 watt or 100 watt until we can confirm one of them. Then we know what all of them are. So again, we need our foot on the Cepheid variable rung solidly to get up to the type 1a supernova rung. And then once we have these different true distances to type 1a supernova, that allows us to have distances and measured velocities to calibrate that Hubble constant so that we can get our foot up to the next rung of redshift. And redshift in the image that I've made stands for the Hubble Lemaitre law because what we are measuring there is redshifts of the galactic expansion and it works for distances that are uh, beyond our gravitational pull as the Milky Way galaxy. So as you read through the, the different methods and distance ranges, I want you to recognize that they overlap and that's absolutely key to this idea of the distance ladder. You don't have to memorize the numbers, but recognizing why we talk about this overlap, the way we talk about stepping up each rung, um, is really essential for our understanding. There's lots of other methods for measuring distances that are outside the scope of our curriculum, but they're in the textbook, and if you're curious, we can always talk about them in student support hours, um, because there's a lot of really interesting ways to verify that we're on the right track with these different methods. So now that we have a sense of how uh, we do determine distances to different objects, we want to consider the different structures that we are a part of on Earth that are kind of like our galactic address. And I want you to think about that term and, and kind of record that term in your notes uh, because I am, I am wanting us to understand the names of types of structures, planets versus stars, but I also want us to recognize that there are things that we are part of, humanity is part of, that have similar objects within the category that we're not at. So what I mean by that, in case that wasn't clear, is we live on Earth. We don't live on Jupiter. We don't live on Mars, even though those three objects are all planets. If we were to have a pen pal on the other side of the universe, we would write our street address, we'd write that we live in Grand Rapids, in Michigan, in the United States, and on Earth, because we are all Earthlings. And it is worth having that sense that everybody that you meet in your entire life are all earthlings. That connection is so useful to recognize in this broad and infinite universe. So we live on Earth, that is our planet. As we think about the larger structure that the Earth is part of, that's the solar system. So we live in the solar system, that's the system around the star, the sun. We don't live around the star Vega. We don't live around the star Rigel. So we're not part of the Vegan system or the Rigelian system. We're part of the solar system. So that's the next step in our galactic address. The solar system is the name of our star system. From there, we have our Milky Way galaxy. That is the galaxy that we are part of. The Milky Way galaxy is where we live. We don't live in the Andromeda galaxy or the Triangulum galaxy. Those are terms and, um, and structures that we have talked about before this video. And my goal as we wrap up this video is to talk about the other structures that we are part of and their names. They're shown in this image uh, and this clickable link uh, in the posted slides are a way that you can kind of scroll through. I'll also try to scroll through them in a video that you can follow along with if it's, um, if it's easier to get that kind of explanation as you go. But let's talk about the next step up from galaxy. So we live in the Milky Way galaxy. We now want to add this idea that we have a neighborhood around the Milky Way galaxy that also includes the Andromeda galaxy and that neighborhood of multiple different galaxies, the large Magellanic cloud and small Magellanic cloud are topics that have come up in different images and slides before. They are part of our local group. The local group is the name of the galaxy cluster. That's the type of object uh, or structure that we're talking about. 
The local group is defined as being gravitationally bound to each other. There are several things that are orbiting the Milky Way. Andromeda has its own posse of um, smaller dwarf galaxies orbiting it. And as we've de determined, Milky Way and Andromeda are on a collision course because gravity is binding them together. The local group is a structure that is part of a larger supercluster. And recently we have, uh, in astronomy, gone from calling it the local supercluster, because that's not a very exciting name, to the Laniakia galaxy supercluster. So Laniakia is the name of our supercluster. We are not part of, for example, the Virgo supercluster. That's a different one. So the local group is the galaxy cluster. Laniakia is the galaxy supercluster. And galaxy superclusters, clusters of different clusters, in the same way that um, multiple neighborhoods together might form a town or multiple towns together might form, it, form a state, galaxy superclusters are the largest true structure, what, what we can call a structure in astronomy, because they are the last stage where we can kind of have some um, gravitational connection beyond the universe expanding. It's still kind of only a partial structure, uh, so that's where we have to stop naming things, because beyond that supercluster is just the infinite universe. So to get our names right, to get our thinking um, straight on this, to be able to answer questions about our galactic address, I want you to pause and make sure that you feel confident knowing the order of these different terms. So pause and read through uh, the different options to pick the correct order from largest to smallest. All right, so if we look, each one of these is comparing the galaxy, the solar system, and the local group. One of those is a new term from the previous slide. Uh, before we take this class, a lot of people kind of just have solar system and galaxy as just two astronomy terms for big things. We want to leave this class understanding that they are vastly different scales. So the local group is the largest out of these three, then the Milky Way galaxy, and then the solar system is the smallest of those three options. So answer two here is the correct one. If we were to go to a larger thing beyond local group, that would be the Laniakia galaxy supercluster. If we were to go to a smaller thing beyond solar system, that would be Earth, our planet. So we're going to end with this slide here. This is a screenshot from a um, simulation, a huge uh computer simulation from 2014. There are others that have happened since then, um, but this one has some really nice data and graphics to talk about, where it is centered on the largest supercluster that the simulation created. Now, the key thing about computer simulations when we're trying to think about large-scale structure is they are not trying to imitate the exact universe. They are trying to give us a statistical understanding of what kind of structure forms. So this isn't trying to be the Laniakia supercluster or anything like that. It is just showing us that type of structure formed naturally out of the starting conditions and physics equations that got put into the system. Dark matter is shown on the left, um, color-coded in purple and blue, and gas density is shown on the right, color-coded in yellows and oranges. And I encourage you to watch the uh, linked video of the, the whole process going on. We are going to be talking in the next video about what it means to be a universe and talking about some kind of basic facts that we want to write down and kind of understand a, a small amount about our universe. And there's a term that we're going to be talking about in that, uh, in that next video, and that's this idea of the observable universe. Light takes time to travel to us. So I've mentioned several times that the universe is infinite in size. We can't see all of it because light takes time to travel to us. There are a hundred billion galaxies in the observable part of the universe that we can see with telescopes. And each of those hundred billion galaxies has a hundred billion stars. So out of all of that space, 
spaces that are too large for our brains to truly fathom. Every single one of us is still an earthling. We're in the solar system. We're in our Milky Way galaxy. So there's a lot of pen pals available out there to send letters to. So it's good to know our galactic address. In the next video, we'll be talking about really big picture ideas. They're going to be tough to think about, and I'm going to be clear on kind of the surface level amount that we really need to take away from um, all of those big ideas. I look forward to uh, working with you in that next video. Thanks for watching.